Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about ionic bonding. Let's start our discussion of ionic bonding with an example. This is a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. And most of us are already aware that these two elements commonly combine to form a material known as sodium chloride, also commonly known as table salt. But what exactly are the interactions and forces that hold these atoms together when they are in this sodium chloride compound? The answer to that question lies in two specific traits. The first is the electronegativity of these elements. Notice that sodium's electronegativity of 0.9 is much, much lower than chlorine atoms electronegativity of 3.0. This means that chlorine atoms have a very strong desire to obtain electrons, while sodium atoms have a very strong desire to give one up. Next, we need to look at their electron configurations. Notice as I bring them a little bit closer here that sodium has a neon core with a 3s1 electron. That's just one electron in its valence shell. Meanwhile, the chlorine atom has a neon core with a 3s2, 3p5 valence shell just one electron away from having a noble gas configuration similar to that of argon. Now in this situation, sodium and chlorine can have a beneficial trade of an electron in which sodium gives up its valence electron and chlorine accepts it. In doing so, the sodium atom now has a positive charge but also a neon uh, electron configuration. Meanwhile, our chlorine now has a negative charge but it also has a very desirable noble gas configuration as well, equal to that of argon. And in obtaining these noble gas configurations, they've each obtained an opposing charge. And it's these opposing charges that hold the sodium ions and chlorine ions together in ionic compounds like sodium chloride. So we've seen now that elements with drastically different electronegativities, such as sodium and chlorine, will combine to form ionic compounds. But there's yet another question we have to ask, and that is when they combine, in what ratio will these ions combine to form a neutral compound overall that's ionic in nature? To start this discussion, let's restrict ourselves to a smaller piece of the periodic table. Specifically, let's take a look at the S and P block elements. Within this small region of the periodic table, it's particularly easy to determine exactly how many of each ion will be present in a given ionic compound. And the reason for this is that if we look at groups 1 through 8, we see that all of the uh, elements within a given group tend to form ions with the same charge. Uh, for example, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, and potassium will tend to form ions with a plus 1 charge, while fluorine, Chlorine and bromine from group 7 tend to form ions with a minus 1 charge. And we can use these charges to help us determine exactly what the ratio will be of each of the elements in a given ionic compound. Now that we have an idea of how to predict which charge each element will take and exactly how many electrons it will be most likely to accept or let go of, Let's try to predict the formula for a few compounds, specifically sodium chloride, magnesium oxide, sodium oxide, and magnesium chloride. Now, sodium chloride we just did, in which we have sodium, which would typically have a plus one charge, and chlorine, which would like to have a minus one charge. A trait of a single electron leads to a compound in which the ratio of sodium and chlorine atoms is one to one. Magnesium and oxygen, on the other hand, tend to form ions with charges of plus 2 and minus 2, involving the exchange of two electrons. Nonetheless, their ratio is still 1 to 1 in order to achieve charge balance. So when we put these two types of compounds together, we see that there's a 1 to 1 mole ratio in each case. NaCl for sodium chloride, MgO for magnesium oxide. But this is not always the case. Take the example of sodium oxide. In this case, sodium ions tend to be monopositive, having a plus one charge, whereas oxide ions tend to have a two minus charge. That means that in the case of sodium oxide, it takes two sodium atoms to let go of enough electrons to satisfy 
the oxygen atom that wants to have two additional electrons for itself. The consequence of this is that we get a compound with a formula of Na2O in which there are twice as many sodium ions as there are oxide ions. In the case of magnesium chloride, we see that magnesium tends to have a two plus charge and therefore gives up two electrons, but chlorine atoms can only accept one each. Consequently, we need a second chloride ion, making the overall formula for this ionic compound, MgCl2. There's a simpler mnemonic to determine exactly what the formula of an ionic compound will be. And we'll do this example using aluminum oxide, sodium oxide, and calcium oxide. Let's take our first example, aluminum oxide, in which aluminum tends to be a three plus ion and oxide a two minus. The easiest way to determine how to balance the charges is simply to take the absolute value of the charge on each ion and juxtapose them to the other ion in the formula. For example, aluminum three plus and oxygen two minus form a compound that is Al2O3. Sodium oxide, sodium one plus and oxygen two minus combine to form a compound Na2O in which the one subscript is typically simply ignored because it's understood. And compounds like calcium oxide in which we have a two plus and a two minus would lead to a formula that reads Ca2O2 but we reduce it to the simplest whole number ratio of Ca1O1 or simply CaO, calcium oxide. So let's quickly summarize what we've discussed about ionic bonding in this video. First, we discussed how ionic bonding occurs between atoms of greatly differing electronegativity, usually more than two units of electronegativity. We discussed how it involves the full exchange of electrons between and among the atoms involved in the ionic compounds that they form. And finally, we took a look at how it leads to compounds that have specific ratios of elements that combine depending on the charge balance that they must achieve in order to create a neutral compound. And that's all for this video, folks. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you on my next video.